Howdy, Maniacs. If you're watching the Main Man Channel, it's not just a name, it's a way of life. You got to improvise, adapt, and overcome each and every day just to make it in this cruel old world. So, that being said, the topic of today's video is school safety and security. Uh, before we go on with that, I started a Facebook group, and this is kind of what that video is catered to. The Facebook group is called Using the Second Amendment to End my shootings. Uh, I probably should have named it using the Second Amendment to, add, to end mass violence, but that's part of it too as well. But anyway, so top of today's video is school safety and security. Okay, and there is two ways to look at this. There needs to be three, three stages, but there's only two right now. Okay. I'll talk about the third stage in a little bit before Columbine and after Columbine. Okay. So, pre Columbine, the uh, school security and safety was this. All right. They, uh, as far as first responders go, first responders were to get there, secure the scene, see what's going on, find out what's going on, make sure nobody else gets in there, and wait for the properly trained people to get there and decide whether they're going to breach or not. And, you know, law enforcement response time around schools can be, you know, 5, 10, 15 minutes sometimes. Uh, that has been improved over the years, mostly. But still in the rural areas, it could be 5, 10, 15 minutes. I mean, you might get an officer there within five minutes. But the thing about it is, it may only just be one officer. And he is back up, maybe 10 minutes away or 15 minutes away. But that's beside the point from what we're going on right now. The point was, law enforcement secured the scene. And... They waited till the right people get there and make the call to breach and the right trained personnel to get in there like SWAT trained folks and stuff like that. And that backfires because the longer you wait to engage active shooters, the more people get hurt, the more innocent lives are taken. Okay? So they looked at that after Columbine and they figured that out. You know, law enforcement did. And they come up with this thing that uh, they trained everybody. Everybody's trained to breach a school if there's an active shooter there or, or a uh, business, whatever it is, school, business, whatever it is. And uh, typically, the first officer on scene, if other officers are going to take a while to get there, he'll decide whether to... Uh, go ahead and engage or wait on backup. And he has to make that call. That's a, that's a big call. You know, if it were me, unless I just, and I, I, and I was in law enforcement, I would probably wait until at least one other officer got there. Because if I went down, at least there would be somebody else to take on the shooter. But, you know, they don't know what they're going into. They don't know if it's going to be multiple shooters or, or several shooters, okay? So that's that's a bad thing there. But typically the ideal is they want at least three or four officers to show up, and the first three or four officers form a team and go in there and breach. Ideal is four officers going in in a diamond pattern, okay? And uh, that way they're all, each one's got a job. One's covering left, one's covering right, one's covering to the rear, and... Uh, one's covering straight ahead. So that way, they go in there and they got all their ace bases covered. Now, they can do it with a three-man team, which is not as good, but it can be done. But they are trained, even if it's just themselves or another, them and another officer. In an active shooter situation now, you breach, you go after the bad guy. Whether you got your, what, what weapons you got on you or whatever. Now, most of them now carry ARs 
and shotguns, you know, usually ARs now, in their uh, cruisers. And uh, they've usually got tack gear, at least a tack vest, in the trunk of their car. Okay. So that helps out too. But uh, here's the thing. You look at it like this. Even though they're trained to go in as soon as they get there and take down the, the, the bad guys. It's a five or ten minute response time, maybe. Look at that on the average. I mean, you know, if you want to, average that out seven minutes, okay? But now, you look at the rural areas, it's going to be more. It's going to be more towards the ten minutes, you know. Like the school I went to elementary school on, there's like one cop on the mountain, and he he might be ten or fifteen minutes away, you know. Because he's having to patrol a lot of area. Now, the role of businesses and the role of schools now in the active shooter situation is, and I've been through a lot of the active shooter training in various businesses and and uh, watched various videos on it and everything like that. That goal is, you know, hey, get out if you can, you know. I'm not, I'm not going to name the exact stuff, I mean, because I don't have a paper right in front of me or anything. But, you know, what's escape if you can. Uh, take cover, you know, if you have to, hide if you have to, and then if you absolutely have to, and the last thing is fight, okay, and do whatever you can, so like, let's say you're hit, y'all are hit in a small room or a classroom, and uh, the, the shooter, the perpetrator, breaches that door. I mean, y'all would need to, like, throw chairs and furniture at him, hit him with chairs and furniture and stuff. That's that's how you do it, to try to survive, whatever you can to do. Now, that being said, you know, a chair against a gun, I don't like those odds, you know. Or uh, my bare hands against a gun, I don't like those odds. Uh, nobody's superhuman and nobody can dodge bullets. So... That being said, what I'm getting into on this, so there was a stage before Columbine, which was the officers secured and waited on the right people to get there. There's a stage after Columbine where the officers breach as immediately as they can now. And at least, you know, these schools have and businesses have uh, that training of what to do, you know, to get out. If they can, if they can't, take cover, hide out, and last resort fight, you know. And, you know, they know the officers are coming, and they got to be prepared to do what the officers say, you know. If the officers come in, you know, you got to hold your hands up, you know, let them know you're a good guy and everything, follow the directions. If they tell you to stay down, stay down. And those first officers that come in, they're not going to be offering medical aid. They can't. Their main job is to take out the bad guy. Now, so there needs to be a third stage. Okay. Some schools have what they call resource officers, that they're extensions of the uh, sheriff's department, police department. They're like reserve officers. Some of them are actual officers. Some of them are retired officers. But they have what they call resource officers. And some of them got, call them something else. Uh a lot of the schools in my area, like Hamilton County, actually fired all theirs, or a lot of them. They just didn't want to pay for them. But anyways, you've got those guys. That's usually only like one or two per, per school while the kids are there. That's not enough. And these guys are probably not, most of them are probably not trained on the take an active shooter down breach you know, or whatever. So that being said, why can't we ask teachers that work in the schools, once who are interested, you know, hey, we want you to be concealed armed in a school. And uh, that way, if you got your kids hid in the classroom because you couldn't get them out, uh, they were too close to the scene, and they, you go under a lockdown. If that bad guy comes into the classroom, 
you've got a little bit more chance of fighting and surviving with a firearm. Even though it's probably not going to be a firearm that matches whatever they got. Maybe. It may or it may not. You got a little bit more chance of fighting with a firearm than if you got a chair or just your bare hands or something like that. You got a chance, a little bit more chance of protecting your children. Now, also, going from that, why don't we have a certain number of teachers? Ones that, you know, show proficiency in firearms, have interest in firearms, maybe even their veterans, maybe even their former law enforcement themselves. But you've got that in every school, okay, these teachers. Maybe they're children of law enforcement officers. Maybe they're avid hunters. But you've got these folks in every school just about. And have those folks go somewhere. Like go see, like send them to Rob Pincus, Send them to James Yeager. Send them to John Lovell. Send them to uh, Clint Smith. You know, send them to uh, Nat Bazzotta. Okay, send them to some some big time firearm school where they can take like a three day class, and they can train, and they can end the the uh, threat. You know they can do that breach training, okay? Because they're probably going to be able to get together and formulate maybe quicker than the law enforcement response. Okay, and why not have those guys a locker or a couple lockers in a couple locations? It's got a couple ARs in it, a couple shotguns, and a, a couple riot vests. And I'm not talking about, you know, just having, you know, you're running a male teacher doing that in that kind of advanced training, but why not any teacher that wants to? be able to carry concealed after a little training class paid for by the school. And the ones that show proficiency and the ones that show something, you know, that who've got some kind of background of firearms, why not they, they form an on-site breach team? Because their response can be like two minutes, maybe, depending on what part of the school they're on. Maybe two of them's on this side of the school and the shooters are on this side. But those two could formulate. Maybe the other two can't formulate it the team because they're having to go locked down but you know wouldn't that be better you know wouldn't that be better than having to wait and more of our children die See, these ideas are not perfect folks uh, and they would need to be you know studied they would need to be you know we need to talk about those ideas and uh you know, maybe change them a little bit, but that's some of the ideas I've got for it. A stage three, you know, after after Columbine, you know, faculty trained. And then proficient faculty trained as a breach team, on-site breach team. That's just my thoughts on it. I'm no expert or anything like that. I've had a couple of firearms classes, you know, and... uh I shoot and hunt, you know, whatever. But, like I say, I'm no expert. And I don't have the perfect answers. But I think teachers armed, even if it's just teachers armed and carrying concealed when they go on the lockdown phase, waiting on law enforcement, in case the bad guy comes in there, that's a lot better off than them having to throw chairs at the bad guy. And if we get to the point and have on-site breach teams, response times goes down. Now, they would those those areas that would have those would have to coordinate with law enforcement. They would have to be in contact with law enforcement. That way law enforcement knew, hey, we're on site team, we're gonna breach here. They'd have to have radios to be able to contact with law enforcement. These ideas aren't perfect, like I say. And, you know, a lot of folks are not going to agree with me on this, but I think at least teachers carrying concealed. 
That way, if they have to go into a lockdown, and I hate to shoot or breach one of them classrooms or where they're hit, they're held up at. I think that's a lot better than nothing, and I think that should be allowed. So that being said, I'm gonna leave it right there. You're watching the main man channel. It's not just the name; it's the way of life. You've got to improvise, adapt, and overcome each and every day to make it in this cruel old world. Please make sure you like, share, and subscribe. I'm gonna leave it at that. Let me know your thoughts on this, and uh, I'll talk to you later.